Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Vazadin. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. Hi, everyone. Thank you guys so, so much for joining me tonight. I'm live here in the studio. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area and for you guys who are joining me for the first time, welcome. I'm super excited to talk about this topic for a lot of reasons, but first of all, the most important reason is that life is difficult and you know what I say, the most important thing in life is finding love and family. So today is September 11th, a very, very important day um, in American history for obvious reasons. And no matter what's going on in the world, people still come to my office looking for family connection. And the one thing that I want you to know as well, listening to the show, is that DNA does not mean family. So thank you for joining tonight's show. Here we go. So I was super honored this week to be in People Magazine, the September 9th, um, uh, the September 9th edition. This edition had, John, who was on the cover? Help me, help me, Kitty help me. Awesome. Kelly Clarkson was on the cover, so look for that cover. If you don't see Kelly Clarkson on the cover, then you know that's not the one, so don't go searching for it. But I'll also include the link in the blog article that goes with today's show. So you can re read about Camille Guadi and what she went through to finally get to the point that she chose an egg donor. And so I wanna to talk to you about the process that I go through with my patients. I know that not everyone's gonna be my patient, but the fact that this public figure TV celebrity was so open about it and shared her story with so many people has really made a huge impact on people all over the world. I got an email, I printed it out, I wanna share it with you right now. I'm gonna share it with you right uh, the second, okay? So. The same week my result came in, my last one, my last negative result, you made a post about Camille Guadi. I went on and read her story and it really touched me. Just like her, I had a difficult time letting go of the idea of using my eggs. I really don't know why I suddenly became so attached to them and I guess that the fact not many people talk about it makes using an egg that is not yours an even bigger stigma. After a long weekend talking and studying, I feel like I'm ready to leave my comfort zone and perhaps increase our chances of reaching our main objective, a positive result, and a healthy pregnancy. My wife and I are really excited and happy. Even though I'm still coming to terms with taking this next step, I'm sure I won't have any regrets once I look at our baby in the future. I'm not the same person I was when I started this journey already, and I know I won't be the same as I am today when it comes to an end. And there are many people who have helped us along the way despite having, your, having found your channel only a few months ago. You've been a great support. So this isn't the only email message that I've received. I've heard from so many patients that read her story and feel like, wow, the stigma is lifted for so many women out there, especially women in their 40s. And if you need to use an egg donor, I mean, there's obviously re obvious reasons why, right? I mean, obvious reason if you're two, two dads that want a baby, a single dad that wants a baby, um, someone who's obviously over a certain age and has run out of um, healthy eggs, for example, someone who's already gone through menopause, um, younger women who have lower egg quality. Um, so there's so many reasons that people need an egg. And so the way I think about it is, you know, when an organ stops working, for example, a liver you get a liver transplant and you just go on living your life in the in the best healthiest way possible and for a lot of people egg donation can be the one thing that helps you live the life the way that you want to live it and to the max so here's the next thing that I talk about with my patients and those are the three questions what do I want what is it going to take to get what I want and am I willing to do it so when it comes to egg donation and the process you have to be ready you can't be in both places you can't in my opinion if you're someone who you know has the option potentially of uh, using your eggs or using them in the past you can't I think it's so difficult to be thinking about cycling again and doing IVF and going and using an egg donor. So I like to tell my patients, there's no such thing as an egg donor emergency. It really isn't going away as an option. So you really have to get to that point where you feel like you have what I call IVF closure. You have to get to the point where you can truly say, even if you haven't done IVF, that you've done everything possible to give yourself the best chance for a pregnancy with your own eggs. 
and then not live with fertility regret. What I don't want to see is, I don't want to see people going through IVF with their own eggs and then moving to egg donor after the IVF cycle doesn't work and then coming back and saying, you know, I think I want to do IVF with my own eggs again to see if it's going to work. I mean, that's not a fair thing to do to yourself emotionally, psychologically, physically. I want you to be really excited about the next step. And how do you get excited? Well, you have to go through your own process and you have to talk to people. So the very first step is, you know, you guys, you just got to figure out, are you ready for an egg donor? And I feel like I have to have a cheering squad behind me that says, yes, I'm ready. And if you're not, well, then I should put up a traffic light here and say, well, then yellow light or stop light. And you have to talk to therapists. You know, it's not just about the tushy method, and I'll get that to a second, or, or an IVF pyramid, and I'll talk to you about that too. It's really about your fertility team. And the T starts with therapists, okay? I have my list of therapists that I love working with, and again, I'll post all their names on the blog article that goes with this show. But find a therapist, whether you're single or you're partnered, whether you're, whether you're heterosexual, homosexual, it's so important to involve everybody in the process. Like Yana says in her book, three makes a baby and sometimes it's actually even more people because you have an extended family that's involved. So read, get educated, do research, talk to people, talk to therapists so that you're really comfortable about the whole process and that makes the stigma go away for you so you can be really proud. Proud of what you're doing, proud of your body. Your body is amazing and it's going to do everything you need it to do and that is to have a healthy pregnancy. And I know it's really funny um, to hear someone say that an IVF pregnancy using donor egg is a natural way of getting pregnant. I know it's, it's a miracle of science. I know that it takes a lot of people and a lot of people are involved, but the way you think about it and, and frame it for yourself is so important. So think about it this way. You're, you're doing what you need to do to do the work to have the family that you've always wanted to, to parent and find joy in, in family. But at the end of the day, when you put that embryo in, it is nature that takes over. It's a very natural process. A pregnancy is natural. So no matter how you get there, that pregnancy is a natural process of an embryo sticking, attaching, and growing. So that's just something that I want you guys to think about. So when we start the process, it's not as easy as, oh, I'll just get an egg and everything's gonna work out. That's why I still wanna educate people about the tushy method. You know, look at the tubes, believe it or not. An, an embryo can get stuck in a fallopian tube if a tube is blocked before you put it in a uterus. Look at the uterus. If there's a fibroid, you don't wanna find out right when you're picking an egg donor, so make sure you have an ultrasound early in the process. Same with sperm, check sperm health. Make sure their swimmers are fast, do extra genetic testing on the sperm if needed, do your preconception panel, get your hormones checked, and do your genetic screens up front so that, again, there are no roadblocks, everything is super smooth, and you know what you're set up to do or as far as what the work that needs to be done as you go through the process. And that process includes what I've called, and not that I call it, but I actually got this from a wonderful doctor here in the Bay Area, Max Azadi. He allowed me to show this on the show tonight. I call it the, or he calls it, I should say, the IVF pyramid. And I think it's such a brilliant way of talking about the IVF process. And this is the thing, when you go through IVF and they're your own eggs, yeah, I mean, you get 10 mature eggs and maybe if you're 40, you're so lucky to get one blastocyst in the end. But when you're using donated eggs, you wanna make sure that you understand what the expectations are from the treatment that you're doing. For example, how many viable embryos you're gonna get from the eggs you start off with. So talk to your doctor about that. Because for example, if I have an egg donor and I get nine mature eggs and I get four blastocysts and three are normal, I am stoked. But if a patient didn't expect that and thought like all nine were gonna be healthy embryos, well, that's really, really hard. That causes a huge amount of disappointment. And so talk to your doctor about what the numbers are up front so that you kind of understand the process along the way by asking these questions, okay? So I've kind of going, I'm going through the process. We've already gone through the first two steps. The first step is make sure you wanna do an egg donor pregnancy, talk to a therapist. Step two is get your tushy in check, your fertility team in check, and make sure you've gone through the IVF pyramid. So now I wanna talk about step three, okay? So step three is the following. Figure out if you wanna use an egg bank, and I'll just go like this, or eggs from a fresh egg donor, okay? So the way you figure out fresh egg donor or an egg bank is 
you have to be excited about the egg donor. There's so many options out there. So how do you know if you're gonna be excited about an egg donor? Well, you have to start searching and you have to be ready for that search and you have to be looking forward to that search. Include a friend, include a family member, include your spouse, your partner, include your doctor. I do these searches with my patients. I love to do them. I ask patients to go through the profiles, pick out the profiles, rank them one. I actually don't want them to rank the profiles. I say, show me the profiles, I'll rank them, then you rank them, and then we'll come together and see how we rank, uh, how we compare our rankings. And what's interesting is oftentimes our, our rankings are very, very similar. And then we can go through and talk to the egg banks, talk to the agencies, and then we can kind of um, uh, screen or weed out and then pick our top picks um, to help us grow our families. So once you're really excited about an egg donor from an egg bank, we want to know how many eggs are available, what their previous history is, for example, how many pregnancies they've had, what the fertilization rate is, what the um, blast formation rate is, or how many embryos were available for transfer. Super important to ask, but if you didn't know these questions, how would you know to even ask them? And so I want you to go through this process not after an egg donor cycle that doesn't work, but before. So I'm hoping that while you're watching this show, you're taking notes, but don't worry, you don't actually have to take notes because like I said, I'm gonna include all this information in the blog article that I'm gonna post after this show. So with my process, once I talk through, my, talk through all these things with my patients, I'll do email introductions with egg bank directors directly with my patient. There are about five that I work with, okay? So Simplify at Pacific Northwest, Fairfax Egg Bank, the World Egg Bank, Cryos, the World Egg Simplify Fair, and California Cryo Bank. There may be more out there, but those are the five that I've all had extremely healthy pregnancies with and great outcomes. They are very transparent with me. Um, you know, when I ask them questions, they'll answer back. And the most important thing is success, the success and um, healthy pregnancies and happy patients. And I've been very happy with working with them. And of the five, several of them do embryo creation. And we'll talk a little bit more, more about that process and what that means in a second. If a patient doesn't like an egg bank donor or she wants to actually search both, what I do is I do or I help them with photo matching. So I have the patient send me a photo of themselves. I know this sounds like, why would a doctor actually get that involved? But I really wanna be a part of the process because I wanna do for my patients what I would want someone to do for me if I were in their shoes. So a patient will send me a photo and I'll send it to the agencies that I work with. I have several egg donor agencies that are, again, very transparent, extremely honest. And the best thing is that they allow me to interview the donor and even screen them and check AMH hormone levels and even genetic screens before the egg donor signs, or before my patient pays any fees to the egg donor agency. And that's super important to me, that we learn if the egg donor is gonna be a good candidate and a good match before my patients fork over thousands and thousands of dollars. So after that photo matching, I then find profiles, I send them to my patient, and then I say, take a look and let me know what you think. I know who my favorites are. And then I even interview and screen egg donors for them. And I do that over video if they're not in person. I love talking to people, I love looking at them, I like looking at how they speak, and when my patients come to me, I get to know them very well. We spend a lot of time together, and if, we've, if we're taking that next step and doing an egg donor cycle, a lot of times the patients have already gone through IVF cycles with me. So you can imagine, we know each other really, really well. They know all the outfits that I have, I have basically seven, they all look like this. <laughs> Same here, since I was 11 years old. I know, you guys, I know, I need a haircut, but I'm so busy working. I started my cases at seven this, mor seven this morning, um, before six yesterday morning, so I love what I do so much, but I, I do need a, a new hairdo, I know. So whenever I'm meeting an egg donor personally, not only am I talking to them, but I'm also doing all the screens. So I'm doing the genetic screen, I'm making sure they've had the psych screen, the medical screening, and then we also make sure that the legal contract is done as well. So that kind of takes you through how we pick a donor, but now I wanna talk through the part about embryo creation and the steps that are involved there. So once you have the egg from the egg bank, we then have for the sperm source, if you're not using a sperm donor from a, from a sperm bank, we have to draw the sperm source or male partner's infectious disease labs and then freeze his sperm. We then actually ship the sperm. Are you ready for this? The sperm gets on a plane <laughs> and flies to the egg bank. There, embryos are created and they have the option of doing genetic testing on the embryos or not. And then the embryos will fly back here. I mean, that sounds like a lot of flying for, for sperm, for embryos back, 
but it actually works really great. With the process of embryo freezing that we have today, it's a really stable system and the embryos, you know, they don't get freezer burned, they don't get harmed in the process. The survival rates that I've experienced so far are 100% of the eggs that I've, I've, helped, um, I've helped coordinate in their creation from the egg banks that I've been working with so far, and I really hope that that continues. And the other thing that we always do and we make sure is done is a genetic carrier screen, because the egg donors at the egg bank have all had genetic screening, and we want to make sure that the sperm source and the egg source don't share the same gene mutations. For example, let's say um, cystic fibrosis. So if an egg donor is a carrier for cystic fibrosis, doesn't mean she has the disease, but we want to make sure that the sperm source is not a carrier as well. So doing those tests up front will prevent the roadblocks of finding out later that, oh man, <laughs> I, I sound like a three, oh man, like a three-year-old, um, that a three-year-old, no, you don't want to like be disappointed like a three-year-old not getting a lollipop that you were hoping to stay on a certain timeline and at the last second you find out that the egg donor is a carrier for something and you didn't t test the sperm source. These tests can take about two weeks or so. On the other hand though, tests are evolving all the time. So right now we have genetic carrier screens that have up to 500 genes, and there's a new one coming out that will have 600 genes. So if an egg donor has done an egg donation, let's say three years ago and her eggs are frozen in egg bank, it's possible that the sperm source is a carrier for diseases and the egg source hasn't been tested for them. So that's the cool thing about uh, working with egg banks that have really good relationships with their egg donors, because guess what they can do? They can reach out to the egg donor and say, hey, we're gonna um, see if you can come back in so we can run your blood and see if you are a carrier for some of the tests that we're now doing these days. So super important um, to do and think about. So another part of the process is preparing for the transfer. You've probably heard me talk about the three month process of getting pregnant or three steps of having a healthy pregnancy. I've done a show on that. And the three steps are number one, create embryos, number two, prepare for transfer, and number three, do the transfer. And the prepare for transfer, I promise I won't flip you off. The, let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so the prepare for transfer way, <laughs> almost did. So the prepare for transfer way involves two tests that I do. I know every doctor's preparation is different, but the two tests that I like to talk to my patients about are the endometrial receptivity assay and the receptiva DX test. Both tests I feel are important and I find a great, uh, I, I find that they're very beneficial, but I don't make the decision to do those testing uh, tests until I know exactly how many embryos I have to transfer. So let's say I went through a fresh egg donor cycle and I have 15 embryos. Well, I don't necessarily think I need to put my patient through all that stuff, okay? But what if we use six eggs from an egg bank and we end up being so lucky to get one or two embryos and my, my patient wants, let's say, one or two pregnancies? Well, in that case, it totally makes sense to do the implantation testing because you don't want to find out after the fact that the embryo transfer didn't work and there was something else that you could have done differently. So if it were me as the patient, the last thing I would want to do is find out after a negative pregnancy test that I could have done an extra test that might have improved my chances of pregnancy. And that's why I talk about these things so, so much, and I hope you're not getting tired of me. I'm gonna go on. So here are a couple other things that I want you guys to think about. You might have not known that I have a website and a program called freezeandshare.com. So if you're using a fresh egg donor, an important question to ask is, what are you gonna do with extra eggs or embryos? So here are some cool things that my patients have done in the past, and I love that my patients do this for egg donors. So even if an egg donor is not part of the freeze and share program, which means she's donating eggs for free in exchange for having the sharing family pay for freezing half for herself plus five years of storage, okay? So that's what the program is. But not every egg donor wants that, right? A lot of them want the compensation instead. And so some of my families, let's say I have an egg donor that I'll retrieve maybe 25 eggs and they know that they only want one baby, well what they're gonna do is they're gonna freeze 10 eggs for the egg donor and very generously gift them back to the egg donor later. So that's kind of cool, that's a cool thing. Um, the other thing that I ask my families to do is if you're using a fresh egg donor, please write her a nice card. It doesn't have to have your name in it or unless you want it to. You can give her a nice sweet bracelet or, or some sort of token of your gratitude and just showing her how important her gift 
is to you and your future family. So those are the kinds of things that really mean a lot to egg donors, believe me, they really do. And certainly if my family is not meeting the egg donor, I always share my gratitude um, with the egg donors as we're going through this process. But to get to this point, it is very important because you may not realize it, but you may end up with let's say 10 embryos that you may not be using in the future. So please consider embryo donation. You can also consider freezing some eggs as eggs um, just so that you don't end up with more unused embryos than you really need to because that's a really big problem here in the country. So I want to kind of go through now the difference between an egg bank and an agency. So the pros of an egg bank is the eggs are readily available. You don't have to deal with signing up with an agency, finding an egg donor that you like and working with her schedule. If let's say she's in school or she has certain breaks and it might not be another four or five months until you can actually cycle. Sometimes they actually do embryo creation, so that's really great. And it may be more cost effective as far as using an egg bank versus a fresh egg donor. However, you only get a certain number of eggs. So if you want more than one baby, the issue with that is what? You might need to buy another set of eggs to have more options for more babies in the future. So that's something important to know, the difference between an egg bank and fresh. And if you want more than one baby, just like I said, if let's say, for example, you only got one embryo and there wasn't another set of eggs available for that egg donor that you use, you may have to use another egg donor for a future pregnancy. That's certainly okay, but I want you to think about that when? before you start the process, not after the process. I want you to think about these things before. So that's why I'm setting you up in a stepwise approach so that you understand the process that I take my patients through so you can benefit from it as well. And the pros of a fresh egg donor, I know it's super obvious. You can tell from my personality that one of the pros I think of is I get to talk to your donor. I get to meet her, I get to see how she talks, how she writes emails. Um, her mannerisms, um, how she looks, because sometimes egg donors don't look the same as they do in their profile compared to in person. And those things are really, really important. They're important to me and something that I would want someone to do for me to make sure that the egg donor is who they say they are. I mean, there are lots of things that I do, for example, checking transcripts and making sure they went to the schools that they went to and that their family history and medical history all check out. So that's the benefit of doing things with a doctor one-on-one -on -one, and using a fresh egg donor. You can also do additional tests that you can't do. For example, I mentioned that there are new genetic screens coming out all the time. And if you're using an egg from an egg bank, you can't necessarily do those tests if the egg donor isn't available anymore, if the egg bank won't allow you to do that. So a couple other things, a couple more than a couple. Who am I joking? More than a couple of things that I really want you to know is that your donor may actually not end up being the perfect match for you for a number of reasons. So you have to kind of be open to that. It's really disappointing, for example, to start with an egg donor and find something out about her medical history and then all of a sudden you feel like, you know, it's literally like the worst day of your life. Like, why is this happening to me? I thought using an egg donor was gonna be so easy. Well, I want it to be easy, so that's why I want you to learn from this show. And so the thing is, it's really important to have an open mind. So that's why I ask my patients to have a list of egg donors. So for example, if something happens, we can definitely go to the next one on our list and feel like we still really love our options and continue to move things forward. So what tests do they go through? That's something that you want to ask and make sure that they're going through all the right tests for you as a family. And then the other thing to know is what are you going to tell, who are you going to tell, and when, and is the egg donor going to be a part of that process? And I think it's lovely when families actually get to Skype with an egg donor, um, even if you don't or even if you want to remain, for example, anonymous to the egg donor, that's totally okay. But Skyping with them, doing a sort of anonymous phone call or video call, I think is really helpful in the beginning because I think it just makes the process more real. You're connecting to another human that's giving you what I call the gift of life. So the other thing that I just skipped over is what you should realize is sometimes, especially a first time donor, they just might not stimulate as well, meaning their egg donor cycle might not go the way that your doctor really was planning on it going. They don't like how it's going, so sometimes they'll cancel it, they'll restart it, or they might say, you know, I don't think that this is a good egg donor for us and this is why. <sighs> As you can tell, I can talk about this forever. So you guys, it's not over. I'm gonna keep talking. 
And being prepared for setbacks is also really, really important. For example, a donor at a baseline ultrasound can have a cyst and it's not her fault. It doesn't mean that anything's wrong, but the cyst, you know, might take a couple weeks to go away and now everything is shifted back. She also might have a positive test, for example, to one of the infectious diseases. You know, in my experience, those tests are a pain because a lot of times they're false positives and now you're telling a young person they can't donate eggs and they really, really wanted to. So those are the things that can happen. So with, with pre-screening, with you know, selecting profiles ahead of time, having backups, all of those things can help prevent you know, egg donor heartbreak so that you're having the smoothest process possible. Because by the time you've gotten to the point for a lot of my patients to choosing an egg donor, you've already had so much heartbreak that most people cannot even believe. I mean, I can believe it. So that's why I want this transition to egg donation to be as smooth as possible. So a couple other things that I want you guys to know about how I approach the egg donor part of things is I ask my egg donors to take CoQ10 at the start of stimulation. Why? Because it won't hurt. The reason why it won't hurt is it can improve egg quality and if I want to you know, take someone through an egg donation cycle, I want to make sure I'm getting the best eggs possible, even if these are younger women that I'm working with. The other thing is making sure that they have a healthy BMI, that they're not smoking, that they're not drinking during the process, and they're eating really healthy. So those are the kinds of things that I talk to you about. What? Oh my gosh, how did this, Paula, how did this end up in oh my there? my goodness. I'm obviously very excited to share with you guys too this slide. And the reason is I've been talking about my crotchless pants forever. Um, but as you can imagine with a number of patients that I see, it's really hard for me to, you know, get, you know, complete all the projects that I have on my, uh, on my plate, but it seems that my egg whisker pants will be coming soon. Um, they're super comfy and cozy and we did a, a photo shoot earlier today and um, this is one of the pictures that I'm, this is just a sneak peek from the photographer that she sent me just showing that you can be a fertility patient and not be butt naked and uncomfortable and cold waiting for your doctor for God knows how long until they come in the room. You can be, you know, more discreet about things and, and comfortable at the same time. I digress, clearly. So thank you guys for joining me on tonight's show. I hope that the five-step process that I just went through with you, I'm not going to go through it, trust me, again, because um, it'll probably take me another, I don't know, 20 minutes to do it. But if you're a patient of mine, you're probably snoring right now because <laughs> you've heard all of these things. But if you're not a patient of mine, I really hope that listening through the steps that I've gone through with you today have been super helpful, super informative, and I hope you guys learned a ton. So thank you guys for watching me live on tonight's show. I hope you guys have a wonderful night and I hope that you all reach your goals the way that they're supposed to have been reached and that you know somehow I can be a part of decreasing the heartache, heartbreak, and thank you guys again. Have a good night, bye-bye. Yay, very good. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Vazadeh. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. 